We are changing a little bit uh, tagging now and going back to, to GPCRs. Uh, they've been already introduced uh, yesterday. I know that many of you are actually experts in GPCR signaling, so I'm not going to repeat all what has been said yesterday besides saying that, as we all know, GPCRs are very important because they eliminate the effects of many hormones, neurotransmitters, and, and they are ideal pharmacological targets. So there's there's been a lot of interest and a lot of work trying to understand how GPCRs work. And over the last 10, 15 years, there has been a tremendous revolution brought about by structural biology, largely thanks but by to the craft and development we currently have. So now we have a lot of, really a lot of atomistic information, structural information about how those time uh, flexible uh, machines uh, work in our cells. Still, and perhaps maybe surprisingly to, to some of you, despite all the efforts, there are a number of fundamental questions about how GPCRs work in the complexity of living cells to produce specific responses that are not fully answered. Some of those questions which I put here might sound trivial to you. So, for instance, where exactly is the GPCR signaling? When is it exactly signaling? What is the role of the local environment? How does this work really in the complexity of the living cells to produce uh, very, very specific responses? And a major reason why we still lack some, some understanding of this, despite all the efforts, is that most of the methods we use in the lab uh, typically require cell disruption uh, uh, and therefore have very limited or, or no uh, spatial temporal resolution. So we cannot really directly answer uh, some of those fundamental questions. And that's why we and others over the years uh, started developing new approaches uh, based on light that allow us to, to directly monitor GPCR signaling in living cells and tissues with high spatial temporal resolution, trying to, to, to answer some of those questions. And, and this cartoon summarizes some of the tools that, that we develop and use in the lab. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time uh, uh, developing and using threat and, and bright sensors that allow us essentially to monitor all the key steps in GPSCR signaling directly in living cells. Uh, these are typically genetically encoded uh, sensors that are being developed by many people uh, uh, and with, with, a, with a good, good contribution of people in Bristol, where I was working before moving to the UK. And this cartoon summarizes some of the sensors that we have. So basically, we can monitor all the key steps in GPCR signaling, starting with the binding of the fluorescent ligand to receptor, the conformational chain that is associated with GPCR activation, the coupling of the proteins, G protein activation, uh, the, the intercellular concentration of cyclic NP or the, the activation of downstream channels like PKA and so on and so forth. As I said, these are genetically encoded, so we can reflect them into cells. In the past, we also developed, generated some transgenic animals that express some of those sensors so that we can work directly with primary cells up to in vivo in some cases with those sensors. However, at some point, we realized that if you really wanted to go deeper, we needed to do something more. And that's when we started working with single molecule microscopy methods, which is something that I'm going to show to you today, which we combined with a number of other uh, now very popular super resolutions, such as say, a microscopy methods. And we also spent quite a lot of time and, and work in the lab developing computational analysis that allow us to expect quantitative information from those imaging data, but sometimes also for them to perform simulations uh, and therefore to, to formulate new testable hypotheses. And this is just an example uh, of what we have been doing. So this is an example of a, of a report and out that, that we generated when I was in Germany uh, that expresses a, a threat sensor for cyclic MP ubiquitously. As you can see, the mouse is fluorescent. You can then take different types of primary cells from the mouse. Uh, these are examples, uh, cardiomyocytes, uh, neurons, and so on and so forth. You can put them under the microscope and monitor in real time the changes in intercellular cyclic MP concentration. For instance, when you see uh, a beta energy uh, agonist, as it's shown here. We can work with single cells. We can also work with more complex preparations. This is an example of acute pituitary slices where we could monitor a single cell level signaling in those cells, or another example where we work uh, with intact ovarian follicles. So you can see maybe here very thin in the center, the ovarian follicles surrounded by thousands of cells where we can monitor uh, very precise changes in cyclic concentrations. Uh, and using this type of approaches, uh, we, uh, we, we, I, one of our main con major contributions was to try and understand 
where the PCRs are sitting in the cell. So if you take still a pharmacology textbook, you will probably still find the PCRs are cell surface receptors. They sit there, they are activated by the agonists, and there was this very strong belief in the field that they would stop signaling once they're internalized into cells, at least by a classical duplomate dependent pathways. However, we were really among the first to, to, to challenge this, this, uh, this dogma, and actually we were among the first to demonstrate that GPCRs can actually continue to signal after internalization from various intercellular compartments. Uh, if you are working on GPCRs, you will know that this has now become a very hot topic in the field. Uh, luckily for us, it has been confirmed by many other groups to, to, to be the case, actually for, for, for many GPCRs, if not for all. And, and there's a lot of interest in the field trying to understand how this works, what are uh, the, the, the physiological implications of the fact that GPCRs are actually signaling from multiple intracellular compartments like endosomes or the Golgi, but there's also interest in, in trying to, to exploit this phenomenon to develop new, if you want, intelligent drugs that might be able to selectively activate or use the GPCRs only in specific compartments to produce more specific responses and, and, and hopefully therefore obtain a new generation of drugs that are more uh, specific and, and, and with fewer uh, side effects. However, I have to say that most of the work that has been done so far has been dealing with uh, receptors for hormones or neurotransmitters, which, which in things that require the neurotransmitter or, or, or the ligand to reach the extracellular space and bind receptors initially located on the cell surface, or in few cases, uh, it has been shown that they can uh, diffuse inside cells and activate receptors that are already located in, inside cells. However, uh, you might also be aware that over the last 15 years or so, we learned that a lot of previously orphan GPCRs actually turned out to be receptors for, for metabolites. So there are many GPCRs for, for various types of metabolites in our cells. And the question for us was, would it be possible that perhaps this uh, modality of GPCR signaling from intracellular compartments might be particularly relevant for, for receptors for metabolites so that the metabolites perhaps don't, they don't even have to leave the cell but perhaps activate GPCRs locally close to the site where they are produced in our cells. So we have a number of projects going on in the lab where we are working on, on uh, receptors for intercellular metabolites. And in particular, we have some projects uh, dealing with fatty acid receptors, which respond to, to short, medium, and long chain fatty acids. There are different uh, uh, fatty acid receptors in our cells. And we have been looking in particular in, in adipocytes, uh, where we could show that a receptor in particular FFA4 is part of a negative feedback loop. So basically, it is activated by uh, fatty acids released but by during lipolysis and it inhibits lipolysis. So it provides like a like a negative feedback loop. And using some of our macroscopy approaches, we can try and look at where the receptor is being activated in those cells. I, I don't have time to show you all the all the results, but very briefly, this is a, a, a referent that I like very much. So first of all, if you look at where the receptor is present. Uh, in a, this is a model of a immortalized brown adipocytes. So these tiny little droplets are in fact lipid droplets in those cells. And quite surprisingly, maybe if you think of GPCRs as, as member receptors, you will see that a lot of the receptors are actually intercellular and very close to the surface of the lipid droplets. We think that they are actually on the yeah, membrane surrounding those lipid droplets. And now here we're using uh, mini deep probe, something you might be familiar with, developed by Chris State initially for, for structural studies. But this can also be used as probes to monitor where receptors are being activated. So basically the way this works, you can fuse them to fluorescent proteins that reside in the cytoplasm as shown here. And when you simulate cells, when you activate receptors, those probes translocate to membranes where you have active receptors. And so what we do here, we have our adipocyte, and then we induce lipolysis uh, with isoproferenone, so we stimulate beta receptors receptors in this lipolysis, and we look at what happens uh, with a, a mini GI uh, a mini GI probe. And very beautifully, I think, what you see is a very rapid translocation of the probe uh, to the place where the receptors are located, which suggests that there is indeed a local GI signaling going on uh, uh, where those receptors are. So this suggests well, that those receptors are working if you want, in an in a intracrine manner, uh, sensing the, the fatty acids that are released from the lipid droplets and, and probably inhibiting the properties there. Uh, well, we are trying to pass it, but I don't have time to go into all the details. I wanted to focus the, the rest part of my talk on what we are doing with, with single molecule microscopy. 
Uh, and this cartoon summarizes the motivation, in fact, for, for doing single molecule microscopy. So classical um, microscopy methods are very good, but there are some limitations. And, and the two main limitations are summarized here. The first one is resolution. As you know, receptors are only a couple of nanometers in size. And unfortunately, there's a theoretical limit in the resolution that we can achieve in far field fluorescence microscopy, which lies at best around 200 nanometers. That's slightly disappointing because, I mean, we're looking at things with a lens that doesn't allow us to, to really directly resolve them. The other problem is that most of the experiments we do in the lab are ensemble methods. So we look at thousands of millions of proteins that are not synchronized, and a lot of information is lost simply by averaging. However, it turns out that if you can observe single molecules, which is now possible thanks to, to, uh, to the development of bright photophores and, and, and very sensitive cameras and microscopes, so you, you can, to some extent, bypass those two limitations. The first one is that you can achieve a much better localization precision than, than the resolution of your microscope. So we can localize individual molecules with a precision of around 10, 20 nanometers, so 10, 20 times better than you can get with, with the best from focal, so to say. And how this works is summarized here. So imagine you start from a tiny little membrane proteins of a couple of nanometers in size. If you can separate molecules in time and or space, then you can play by a little tree. So the molecule will appear as a much larger blob through the lenses of your microscope because of the fraction of light. However, you can determine quite precisely the center of mass of your, of your molecule. And that can be done with a procedure that essentially depends on the number of photons you collect. And for practical reasons, you can achieve a localization, as I said, about 10, 20 nanometers in our, uh, in our settings. The other thing is that because now you can monitor single molecules, you can do that for a thousand millions of molecules, you can acquire very uh, thorough dynamic characterization of complex uh, population, populations of molecules, looking how they move, how they arrange, how they interact with each other, and so forth. And, and we, in the lab, we are, we are doing this. Uh, with living cells, this is an example of individual receptors diffusing on the surface of a living cell. If you have not seen single molecule microscopy experiments before, this is played back in, in real time, essentially. And we're used to look at receptors in cartoons, but things are, are going on like any in our cells. So receptors diffuse very fast on the surface of our cells. A moment they are here, another moment they will be somewhere else. And it's something that I think we need to take into consideration. We can work with constitutive systems, for instance, like uh, supported lipid bilayers where we can add fluorescently labeled proteins. This is an example with fluorescent labeled beta resins. I will come back to that. Or we can work with immobilized proteins doing for some single molecule fraction experiments where we're looking at conformation of dynamics within single uh, proteins. And this is an example of a paper we published a few years ago where we applied these methods to, to, to monitor receptor G protein interactions mm -hmm. at the single molecule level. So basically what you see here in green, each trajectory is a receptor, in magenta trajectory is a G protein, and we can really follow individual receptors and G proteins as they diffuse and interact on the surface of a living cell with very high spatial temporal resolution. So that's published. Uh, and uh, now I would like to show you some more recent work we have been doing applying these methods to the other fundamental interaction involving GPCR signaling, which is the interaction between an active uh, and phosphorylated GPCR with beta resin. Uh, I think you're all familiar with this, but very briefly, uh, after a, a receptor is activated, upon at least a prompt long simulation, the, the receptor is phosphorylated by GRKs, and this is the trigger for the recruitment of a resin from the cytoplasm, which interact with the receptor. And they do two main things. They mediate rapid singular desensitization. They also mediate receptor internalization by interacting with AP2 and, and clustering. And, and there has been a lot of work uh, uh, showing that beta resin can also mediate some effects of their own, so some G-protein independent uh, signals. Um, however, if you take again these cartoons, what you would typically see, uh, I would like to spread two things. You would typically see that the resin comes from the cytoplasm and binds directly to receptors on the cell surface. And the other thing is that, at least based on conventional approaches, people thought that this interaction, at least for some receptors, would be rather strong. And the reason for that is that if you perform a simple classical composite microscopy experiment, you would see, uh, at least with some receptors, uh, the receptors and the resin co internalizing and staying together in endosomes for, for instance, periods of time, so 30 minutes uh, and more. 
Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that Arresi is a very full molecule, if you want. It's a very complex and dynamic molecule. Uh, it exists uh, in uh, at least two main conformation, one inactive and, and one, uh, so to say, active conformation. It has a number of interactions going on. So it has at least two main types of interactions with the receptor. One that involves the C chain, the phosphorylated C chain of the receptor that binds to beta resin, and another one that involves uh, this central part of beta resin, uh, where there is this important finger loop that interacts with the core of the receptor, and that's what we think is mediating uh, fast signal the sensitization by impeding the, the coupling of the receptor uh, with this protein. So very complex and dynamic molecules interacts. It has at least two poses and two modes of interaction with the receptors, but it interacts with many other things. It, it interacts with clattering and AP2, as I mentioned already. There, are, there is at least one P2 binding site here, and, it, and it's probably interacting with other lipids, as I'm sure, and I'm going to show up in, in a minute. Uh, and so we thought that perhaps our single molecule approach could be helpful to try and, and understand this complex system. This has been the work of Dumber, uh, biologists, young the theoretical physicists, and, and, and Jack, as a like, PhD student in the lab. And so the way we do this is to label receptors and beta resins with bright organic fluorophores to this net and, and halo tags. Uh, because we're interested at events that happen close to the cell surface, we use a specialized microscopy method that is called TURF, total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, which allows us to illuminate essentially only the plasma membrane or very thin layer of our cells that is directly facing our cover slit. And this is how a, a three color experiments now look like. So we can monitor individual uh, receptors, the, the beta resin molecules that appear from the side of the plasma as they bind uh, to the receptors on the plasma membrane. And we also monitor entirely what it is here. And what you can see here are the individual trajectories of, of those molecules that we can report. Uh, as I mentioned before, these are highly quantitative methods. We can acquire, in fact, millions of single molecule trajectories and apply uh, very robust statistical approaches to try and, and understand what's going on in our system. And I will not have time to show you all the results from, from our recent study, but basically we ended up studying five different receptors which cover a spectrum of affinity uh, for beta resin, uh, a number of mutants interfering with some of the key interactions there. And we also combined this a little bit with MD simulations trying to, to link that to some more uh, mechanistic uh, understanding. And just to give you an idea, we ended up acquiring more than 6 million individual trajectories in this size. So it's a very, very rich uh, data set. And what I'm going to show you is, is three key findings. So the first and, and rather surprising thing for us uh, came already when uh, Jana Selen uh, and her group in Barcelona performed some MD simulations for us. And what they observed, what is shown here, is some tendency of beta resin to spontaneously insert in, into the lipid bilayer which initially involves this part of the molecule, which is the, the C edge of the molecule. And actually, this is something obviously we could confirm experimentally. Uh, for instance, using purified beta resin and supported lipid bilayer. So we take beta resin, we fluorescently label it, and we add it to, to support the lipid bilayer. We have no other receptors, proteins whatsoever in this system. And we can very nicely see that indeed, beta resin can spontaneously insert into the lipid bilayer. And diffuse laterally as shown by this uh, trajectories uh, here, which is very different from, from, from the textbook knowledge. And then we went to, to mutagenize some of the uh, critical loops in, in the C edge that we predicted would, would be critical for this interaction. And in fact, if you do that, you largely lose uh, beta resin in, in, in interaction with receptors and activation in, in, in living cells. The, so that was quite surprising. The second surprise for us came when we looked at how individual receptors and terrestrial molecules behave. What is shown here, uh, and what we observed is that the vast majority of interactions do not involve terrestrial coming from the cytoplasm, as we thought, but actually involve terrestrial that are already pre-associated with the lipid bilayer, uh, as shown in this example here. So we have a receptor diffusing, a terrestrial appearing on the membrane, diffusing a tiny for a tiny little while until they undergo an interaction uh, with the receptor. And, and we could also quite precisely monitor and, and, and measure the, the duration of those interactions. And again, perhaps surprisingly, uh, what we found is that at least the initial interactions between receptors and beta resin are much more dynamic and much more shortly than people thought. 
And to give you an idea, the, the average tau for those interactions is only about a second. So much, much shorter than, than people thought before. Uh, so if you if you start now from beta less than which is anchored on the CIG and you continue your MD simulations, there's another thing that is quite interesting that we observe, which is that at times uh, the finger loop, which is the domain that is very important for interacting with the core of the research, actually uh, adopts spontaneously adopt an active conformation and can also insert into the liquid by layer, which was a surprise. And that's again something we could. Uh, to some extent verified experimentally. And, and, and this cartoon summarizes what, what we are now proposing, if you want, as, as a revised model for how receptors and guitarists in Markov would interact. So we think that there is kind of this kind of dynamic the association of beta resin with the plasma membrane. Uh, beta resin uh, then diffuses laterally to, to undergo transient interactions with the receptors. And, and what we think is happening here is that. Uh, the receptor catalyzes the conversion of beta resin into an active light conformation with extension of this finger loop. Uh, and this leads to stabilization of beta resin in an active light conformation of the plasma membrane so that beta resin stays longer on the plasma membrane. And, it, and beta resin typically reaches platinum coated peaks independently of the initial receptor that, it, that has activated it. And only when it's there, it starts really recruiting receptors uh, that accumulate in platinum coated peaks to, to, to mediate GPCR internalization. So, in essence, uh, it is not different uh, from, from the classical model, but it's a much, much more dynamic picture that's, that we could only observe now uh, using single molecule approaches. Of course, this is all new, and we and others are, are thinking about what could be the implications of this for, for drug development, things like bias and, and other things you are very familiar with. And just going back, I'm, I'm finished, just going back to the initial, uh, oh, well, to, to, to the main focus of, of, of your of your uh, uh, meeting, uh, I think this arrestin, it could be a very interesting model to study a loss of impacts. We have all these in various interactions taking place that are lighter there. And we and others are looking into this. Uh, and we have some initial data that, that suggests that there is, for instance, a loss of communication between this part of the molecule, which is the one where the phosphorylated peptide coming from the receptor binds to, and in fact, the, the C edge. Uh, uh, of, of the molecule, which is the one that interacts uh, with a liquid layer. So, for instance, if you delete, if you remove this interaction, you see some distant changes in the CI, uh, which I think is something uh, is quite interesting and it's something we are following up experimentally trying to understand uh, how it works. And with that, I would like to, to thank you for your attention. The people in my life who contributed to this study, our uh, international collaborators and the funding agencies. Uh, for your support, and if there is time, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the for the lecture. That was very interesting. We have question mark. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. So I have two small questions. The process is essentially so. The first one is: uh, Will you mutate uh, to be arrested, prevent association with the membrane effects correctly? Uh, do you see still functional system so association with the receptor or not? It's basically that. So it doesn't it doesn't interact efficient. I mean, we can't attempt any any productive interactions with the receptor, and it does no longer accumulate in carbon for the peak. So it's essentially a, a dead mode. And the second curiosity is uh, uh, in your single molecule fluorescence. I remember in the field of myosin. Uh, there was a technique called Fiona to follow molecules. Is the same technique that you're using? No, I mean, it's analog. I mean, it's related, but no, this is, if you want, I don't know if I should call it simple, but we, we label all molecules with, with phosphorus, with bright phosphorus, and because we can achieve very sparse labeling, so the molecules are far enough from each other that we can do multiple parts of tracking and follow them in real time uh, with, with a resolution, as I said, of about 10, 20 nanometers in space. And maybe around 20 milliseconds in time. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, I have a question about the last slides, two slides. Where are you? Uh, Try to get there. Uh, no, that's the last one, not the first one. Um, and uh, uh, which is uh, about the uh, allosteric yeah. transition, right? Yes. 
So this would be, uh, I think, one of the very first well established cases where the monomer can undergo allosteric interaction, um, which uh, I have open uh, to this possibility. But uh, my question is uh, <coughs> would harvesting make transient oligomers for, for getting the, the conformation of change or not? Uh, because uh, this uh, could be a possibility. I don't want absolutely to save the oligomeric situation. There could be some monomeric one. I accept that. But my question is whether you have a transient oligomeric state for the transition. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, for the comments and the, and the very relevant question. In fact, it has been shown that harvesting can live in vitro uh, for diamonds and potentially oligomers. In living cells, I have to say that the evidence is weak at the moment. So uh, I don't know if in our chemicals we work with very, very low densities to be able to, 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 to do single particle tracking. So I, it would have been hard for us to see the dimerization under our conditions. It is possible that, that it plays a role. It's a very complex molecule. It binds, even if I describe it as a monomer, in fact, it, it's continuously binding to many, many things, potentially including other beta resin molecules in a cell. So it is possible that some of the in fact, I'll, I'll potentially I'll say if it's come from, from interaction with other proteins. So the question that uh, the case of the uh the different possibility that you have in the uh beta testing where the different possibilization sites are activated. So I know that this is very complex and uh, I was just wondering if if uh, uh, you think that uh, this uh, network of different population states can uh, understandably impact the way in which uh, the uh, better vaccine binds to the to the members or unbind or uh, as well as the binding with the PCRs and the multiplication. So how how can you use this? Yeah, I mean that, that's another very relevant question. As you know, people have proposed this barcode, yeah. whatever model where the idea is that you might get different patterns of phosphorylation and and depending on that, you know, resin might even adopt different conformations and, and couple to different downstream effects. Uh, it's something we are working on, but I don't have the final answer. But, but what I can tell you is that we compare different receptors, which are, are, are very different, you know, patterns and also very different strengths of, of interaction with the resin, also different propensity to do tail versus core interaction with the resin. And you can see those comparison there. This is beta 1, beta 2, and beta 2, b 2 which go from very weak to, to strong interaction. And the, quite, the rather surprising thing for us is that, so we could determine or, or estimate K on and K off for those interactions. And most of the, of the higher affinity uh, seems to be encoded by K on and not so much by K off. So it looks like receptors that have stronger interaction with beta resin is because they have a higher probability of, of forming a, a productive complex with beta resin rather than staying longer together with the resin, at least for the very initial. Interactions, which is what we're looking at. Because uh, there was a old tradition according to which uh, there might be uh, several receptors for uh, one um, uh, receiving speculometry. So, uh, uh, are you data in agreement with this uh, of the whole? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So, as I said, it, it's a bit difficult for us because we are we are working at very low density. So, we have been doing work using these approaches, looking at GPCR dimerization and oligomerization. Uh, we haven't really looked at that here, but the chance now, I mean, at these densities, the most GPCRs are in fact normal. But you find a tiny little proportion of, of transient dimers, whatever that means. Uh, but the chance of picking one with arrested molecule interacting with a dimer is so low that we would have to acquire not millions, but tens of hundreds of millions of projected really to have enough statistics to answer your question. Thank you very much. All right, let's thank Ramin again.